Hello, welcome to Math 36 via online. This time for sure I'm recording. I'm sorry about our last class meeting and did not record. I don't know what I did wrong. I thought I pressed record, but this time for sure it's recording. And I've had a chance to troubleshoot this with other courses. So you guys are, are fine. Um, notice that I did post your Zoom. Um, couple of minutes before class started. And this is because on the previous lecture I had today, I had someone bomb our Zoom meeting. So someone who was not part of the class was just being inappropriate and asking things that made no sense and just being extra disruptive. So from now on, I won't post our Zoom meeting until a couple of minutes before under announcement. Also, just to make sure there's no, um, unnecessary noise and by that I'm talking about like you moving your laptop back and forth or a bird on the outside or something along those lines or my neighbor having his dog out I have this wonderful neighbor who likes to let his dog on my side to pee and poo I just saw him all right so when you guys lock in your your, your microphone is muted and uh, this is so we don't hear any background noise. But if you ever have a, qu a question, just please feel free to unmute yourself so you can ask your question. So usually the way I see it is there next to your face, there's an unmute button once you put your mouse there or your finger there. And that's where you can unmute yourself. All right. So let's go ahead and start with today's lecture. So to continue. Last week I said I would post a quiz and I didn't and we'll start with these online quizzes this week. We'll have section quizzes. Um, I will change our syllabus breakdown so we can have section quizzes and then test quizzes and then we can have our chapter, I'm sorry, our two chapter exams. So our next exam will, will cover chapters three and four. All right. We have about 13 people, so I'm sure more people will chime in. Let's go ahead and begin. So let me go ahead and share my screen. We're continuing with section 4.1. Can everyone see my screen? If someone can unmute themselves and let me know what you're seeing. Yeah, I can see it. Four point one. Four point one introduction of graphing. Thank you so much. Thank you so so much. All right, so let's continue with section four point one introduction of graphing. This one is actually uh, one thirty six content. So you're gonna have a quiz on this, but it's gonna be on your one thirty six Canvas shell. That's where you'll find it. Your 136 content, I'll leave all those quizzes open until the end of that course. Your 136 course ends about two weeks before your 36 course, so sometime late May. Okay, so this section is just to remember some graphing information we might have forgotten. So an introduction. In chapter four, we learn to graph each trig function. In preparation, we look at the features of graphing functions in general, and then relate those features to graphs of trig functions. So aids for graphing. We can say that a function is increasing or decreasing, mainly by its slope. So let's read what your book says. Most linear functions either increase or decrease, and the slope of the line M indicates which. So a line is said to be increasing when it has a positive slope. So if you're ever unsure, remember we read math from left to right. That's how we read math. And if you're ever unsure what's going on, you can always draw a stick person and think, okay, are they going up the stairs or are they going down the stairs, right? If they're going up, they're increasing, down, they're decreasing. And if we have a slope of zero, 
if you have a slope of zero, then it's neither increasing or decreasing. We have a horizontal line. Moving forward, most nonlinear functions also have intervals where they increase. They either go um, get higher from left to right or decrease, get lower from left to right. So here, even though it's not a line, we can say it's decreasing, right? This part right here, I'm sorry, increasing. It's going up here, it's going down, it's decreasing. And we can put this all together, right? So for example, we can say that the function is decreasing from A to B, going down from A to B, from A to B, and it is increasing going up from B to C. So it doesn't all have to be just increasing or decreasing like a line. When we have a function, there can be a mixture of them, right? So for example, this is an image of what you might think to be something like a parabola. And a parabola has a portion where it's decreasing and a portion where it's increasing. Uh, reading forward, a function that both increases and decreases has either a highest point maximum or a lowest point minimum, where the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Maximum and minimum points are discussed in section 4.2. B, concavity and curvature. Concavity of a, of a function on an interval has a formal definition that is beyond the scope of this course. Formally, though, concavity is a curvature that best, that's best understood visually. Note, a line has no concavity or no curvature. A line, if you may recall, is y equals mx plus b. And I can this a line. Here is an informal definition of concavity on, on an interval. In the interval, shade the inside above or below of that function that's being bended toward. So here shows the shaded portion for each one, right? So you see them shaded. Let's continue reading. reading. Here is an informal description of concavity on an interval. In the interval, shade the side above or below of the function it's being bended toward. One, if the shaded region is below the curve, the function is concave downward on that interval. If the shear region is above the curve, then the function is concave upward. So think of your parabolas. You have a parabola, you have some that open down, that's concave downward, some that open up, concave, concave upward. Point of inflection. Point of inflection is where you change from increasing to decreasing, and that's the best way to describe it. It's a change from decreasing to increasing. Let's see what the book says. Many functions have more than one kind of concavity. If a point's graph changes concavity from one interval to the next, the change occurs at a single point, the end of one interval, and the beginning point of the next. We call this point a point of inflection. So you see how right here it's going down? It's um, decreasing. And then um, well, I guess the shading point is a better, better way to explain how it change, changes the shading from above to below. That's our point of inflection right here. We'll see graphs that look a lot like this as we move forward to 4.2. Apparent function. So apparent function is just your general function without any shifts. So without any shifts. That would be a parent function. A parent function is a function in its most basic form, such as f of x equals x squared, f of x equals square root of x, or f of x equals one over x. And as you will see in section 4.2, f of x equals cosine of x and f of x equals sine of x. So this is what we're gonna learn in 4.2. 
in each of these examples, a parent function, the argument is just x. And in just x squared, and just, x, just square root of x, and just 1 over x. Later in this section, we'll see functions with different arguments, such as plus x plus 3 squared and x minus 4 squared. Graphing parabolas. We look at the features of a parabola to help us understand the features associated with graphing trig functions. For example, if we understand the features of the graph of the parent function f of x equals x squared, then we can just use those features to help us graph f of x equals x squared plus 3, or g of x equals negative x squared, or h of x equals x minus 5 squared. So in general, it's trying to figure out what your parent graph is. And once you know what your parent graph should look like, then you can go ahead and change the shifts. In general, it's defined as a parent function is defined as y equals f of x. Now we can apply shifts. These shifts can be as y is equal to f of x minus or plus h and plus or minus k. And you can have a here. So what does each one of these mean? If I have a plus or a minus a number inside the parentheses, this is what you're looking for, inside the parentheses, inside the function, then it's going to be a horizontal shift. If I have a minus h, it's going to shift to the right. Going to shift to the right. If I have a plus h, it's going to shift to the left. Now I know that might feel counterintuitive because if we look at our number line, to the right we have the positive, to the left we have negatives, but that's not how h's work. They work opposite. If I have a k, a k, so a number that is outside the parentheses, that will give us a vertical shift. So if I have plus a number, it will move up those many units, minus a number, it'll shift down that number of units. Now this a. If your a is bigger than one, whether it's two, three, two and a half, 10 over three, whatever it may be, then it's called a vertical stretch. It's gonna make it skinnier. If your number a is between 0 and 1, then it's the compression. So this would be like 1 half, 1 third, 99 over 100. As long as it's less than 1 but bigger than 0, it causes a compression. It's made to look, made to look wider. And one more, if we have if we have a negative outside of our a or the initial part of our function. A negative causes a reflection across the x-axis. So hopefully this seems a bit familiar from a class algebra course made from college algebra or maybe from algebra two when you were in high school. So all these shifts work in our functions. And if it doesn't seem familiar, we will for sure develop as you continue. So let's graph the parent function. So example one, graph the parent function f of x equals x squared. All right, whenever we want to graph something, it's always a good way to do a chart. A chart is cool because we can graph no matter what we're working with. If I have no clue, I can do a chart. I can pick some values for x, whatever numbers we see fit, and I can plug it in and get some output to get a point, a corner point. So here we're testing zero, negative, and positive numbers. So we're plugging them in for x. So whatever this x is, we're going to choose a new number for it. So let's plug in zero. Zero squared is zero, so we have a point zero, zero. We plug in one. One squared is one, so we get one for my x. This is your x. And then a one for your output. If I plug in a two, 2 squared is 4, so my x is 2, my answer is my y, which is 4. So I can go ahead and plot all these points, and we see them all plotted. 
and we see we have a parabola. Parabola opens up. Now, because it doesn't have any shifts, this is called your parent function. Any questions about graphing a parabola? Nothing. Okay. Now we're going to see all these shifts put together. So they're right here as a um, a cheat sheet, I guess you can say, of how they work. So this is your shifts cheat sheet. Now we're going to develop each shift separately. So you kind of got to preview what to expect. So one of the important things is symmetry, meaning it's like a mirror image. Here is what we can learn from the graph of one parent function say f of x equals x squared. The graph has an upward concavity throughout. Two, the line of symmetry is the line x equals zero. The vertex is zero, zero, and it's also on the line of symmetry. And every point of the parabola except the vertex has a symmetric partner. So the line of symmetry is this line where each half is being mirrored to the other side. So this is your axis of symmetry. In this case, a vertical line is always x equals, and because our x is at zero, it is x equals zero. Now what's cool about this symmetry is it lets us reflect points over. So if you wanted to, you can only find one side and then find the rest using symmetry. Meaning, if I have negative 1, 1, it will attach to 1 off and it'll line up. Negative 2 and 4, they'll line up too. And notice they're 2 away from the vertex. Negative 3, 9 and 3, 9, they will match up. And they're both 3 away from the vertex. So that's what it's trying to show you, that you can be lazy. And honestly, all mathematicians are lazy. So I encourage you to be lazy whenever you can. And we're going to be lazy by only doing one half of our graph and reflecting the other one over. Being lazy will be very helpful when you do trig functions. All right, moving forward to a vertical shift. Let's take a closer look at the notion of symmetric partners. Once we identify the vertex of the parabola, we need only to find sometimes three points on each right side of the line of symmetry their symmetric partners can be identified and we have enough points to graph the parabola. So here they, they worked with this graph, f of x equals x squared plus three. And they were like, okay, let's be lazy. Let's only find zero, one, and two. All right, so we plug in zero for x, zero squared plus three is three, one, and then let's plug in a one for, z, for x, so we have one squared plus three is four, Let's plug in a two for x, so we get x squared plus three, and we get seven, so we have these three points. So we're only gonna graph those points. Zero, three, one, four, and two, seven. Now we're gonna be lazy, and we're going, only going to use those three points to find my next points. All right, well, one, four is one away from the vertex, so it lines up with the one that's one away. 2, 7 is 2 away from the vertex, 1, 2. So it's going to line up 2 away from the vertex as well, 1, 2. And now we have this new point. So we can graph a parabola only using half of the points because I know it's symmetric. Now notice because I had a plus 3, so let me erase my parabola, my mess in the parabola. Notice we have this plus 3. What do you see that's different between this graph and the graph of our parent function? So notice our parent function starts at zero and our shifted one plus three, it's up three, right? One, two, three. It's up three units. So here we can see a vertical shift firsthand. You'll notice that compared to the parent function, the vertex is still on the y-axis, but it has three units higher. In other words, the parabola has been shifted up three. This is called a vertical shift. 
All right, so here we have a graph and it has x squared minus four. Use the table of values to find the vertex and the three points to find the right of the vertex given vertex seven points in all, then graph the parabola. All right, so I know this parabola, if the parent function is at the center of the vertex at zero, zero, this one will be shifted down four, right? So that's what we can expect. So our y's are gonna be sort of different, but we still start at zero. So the points for x I will choose are zero, one, and two. And we can use those to graph our entire parabola. All right, let's break this out. So we're gonna let x be zero. So I have zero squared minus four. Zero squared is zero, minus four, we get negative four. So my point is zero comma negative four. Now I have uh, x to be one. So I have one squared minus four. I have one minus four, one squared is one. So we're left with negative three. So I have the point one comma negative three. Now let x be two, two squared. Um, minus four, so I have four minus four, we get zero. So I have two comma zero. Let's go ahead and plot these points. So I have zero negative four. I have one negative three. And I have two comma zero. Now I can use this, these points to plot other points. This one that's one away that'll line up is right here at negative one, negative three. And I have this one lighting up two points away. So one, two, right here. Let me erase my little doodle. Okay, and I can go ahead and connect these points to get my parabola. No. Here we have our parabola. So it should feel like review, right? So again, this is 136 content and it's meant to help us remember how we go about graphing. Where, how do we graph? What do we do? Because just how we learn how to graph lines, parabolas, rational functions, uh, polynomial functions, all of our rules that we learn, they never go away. We just apply them differently using trigonometry. Let's talk about a horizontal shift. When a constant is added directly to an argument as in x plus three squared or x minus two squared, the resulted graph is shifted horizontally left or right from the graph of the parent function, especially the vertex is shifted and the rest of the graph follows. The question is, will the vertex be shifted to the left or to the right? Well, I'll cut to this chase. If we have a plus, like here, it's gonna be shifted to the left. So it's gonna be shifted left three. If I have a minus, it's gonna be shifted to the right, right four. And it tells you we're here, right here. For example, in the function f of x equals x minus four squared, the argument is x minus four. When we set this argument equal to zero, we get x equals positive four. This means the vertex is at four and the graph is shifted to four to the right. Now in this example, we wanna graph this parent function that shifted to the left right, to the left five. Graph f of x equals x squared, x plus five squared. First identify the vertex by setting the argument equal to zero. Then use the table to find two points to the right of the vertex. Five points in all. Okay, so I know for sure if my vertex will be right here at negative five. So I want to be lazy, right? That's the whole point. So let's go ahead and test x equals four and let's test x 
negative 4, and x equals negative 3. That will give you a point that's on this side and a point on that side. And then I can reflect them over. So let's find, let's let x be negative 4, which we know should give us 0. So that's going to be our vertex. I'm sorry, negative 5. And let's also try negative 4 and negative 3. All right, go ahead and work those out. I'll give you about a minute. All right, so let's see if you're on the right track. So if we input negative 5, I have 5, negative 5 comma 0. If I plug in negative 4, negative 4 plus 5 squared equals 1 squared, which is 1. So I have negative 4 comma 1. Negative 3, negative 3 plus 5 squared gives us 2 squared, which is 4. So I have the point negative 3 comma 4. All right. So I have negative 5 comma 0, negative 4 comma 1, and negative 3, 2. Now let's reflect those over. One away from the vertex will give us the same lineup. Two away from the vertex along our axis symmetry, right? Two away would be right here. And this will give us our graph, our parabola. Isn't that so cool? We did a work of only three points and we have a lot more than what we were originally we originally found. All right, wider and narrower parabolas. When x squared has a positive coefficient such as three, four, or a one third, the graph is either wider or narrower than the parent function. For example, four x squared rises from point to point four times faster than the parent function. Similarly, one-third x squared rises from each point one-third as fast, so it's lower, it's wider. All right, I'm going to skip example 4x, 4x, example 4, but you can try one on your own. It just shows how it's narrower, narrower, and here it shows how it's wider, and it's giving you the parent function. This is your x squared, so you can compare how they're skinnier. And wider. And if we add a negative, reflection about the x axis, it flips it over. So if we want to graph x negative x squared, we would see that it would just be the same graph pointed downward. All right, and here's a summary for compression or stretch. Summary for compression. Or a stretch. So compression is wider, the stretch is more skinny. So it's wider when it's a fraction between 0 and 1, and it's narrower when it's bigger than 1. All right, that's all we had for 4.1. Let's go on to 4.2, our actual trig content. All right, so brace yourself. This is a pretty lengthy section, and we're going to go through it super slow because I want to make sure that you're on the right track. So 
So if you want to right now, it'd be a good point to like get up, get yourself a drink, a snack, go to the bathroom. It's a lengthy one, so prep yourself. All right, 4.2. This is where all the fun happens. So this is for sure part of your Math 36. It's not review, it's not 136 content. Let's start with the introduction. In this section, we continue to expand the definitions of sine and cosine. Here is the progression of definitions we have seen so far, including how one definition leads to the next. Right triangle definitions. So we defined earlier that sine of A is opposite of A over hypotenuse and cosine of A is adjacent of A over hypotenuse. These are foundation definitions showing sine and cosine as ratios of sides. In the xy plane, we saw how if we draw something on the first quadrant, we have our theta and our hypotenuse, and this would be our r. We have opposite, which is r, y, and adjacent, which is x. And we can come up with those same definitions. These were developed from a right triangle in the first quadrant and then expanded to all four quadrants. Three, in the unit circle, we have unit circle definitions. So sine of theta is your y-coordinate and cosine of theta is your x-coordinate. So for example, always think of your first quadrant, right? We have 30, 45, and 60. And we have coordinate points. So we have well, I'm thinking of myself in that space. So we think of, um, what is it? Um, they're all over two. And then we have one, two, three, one, two, three. And they have square roots. Right, did I do that correctly? Hopefully I did. All right, and we know that sine is the y, is the y, and cosine is the x. So if I'm asking for cosine of 45, it'll be square root of 2 over 2. If I want sine of 30, it would be the y, which is a half. Moving forward, we now expand our understanding of these functions by building the sine and cosine value in the unit circle. We look at each separately using function notation, such as f of t equals sine of t and g of t equals cosine of t. The graph of each function is based on its own unit circle values reg without regard of the values of any other trig function. In this section, we explore the characteristics of each graph individually, but recognize important of common characteristics. All right, as I continue for the remainder of this section, please have your unit circle handy. I gave you a printed unit circle, I believe. Or if not, you for sure built one at some point. All right, the chart. Yeah, so have it handy. I mean, Ideally, I would have you memorize this and like just quiz you on memorizing it each time. But I mean, I don't know if you're being honest or not. So just have a unit circle handy for the remainder of this course. Just have it next to you as you're doing your homework, quizzes, your tests. I mean, it's pretty much open book class from now on. Charts of unit circle sine and cosine values. Recall in section 3.5 these charts below of sine and cosine values from around the unit circle. Notice how they rise and fall, increase and decrease. So this is our last chapter three section, where if you think of this as a number line, so say this is a number line, I'm sorry, a Cartesian plane. So this is my x axis, and this is my y axis. Then we can see that each one of these is a point that I will graph. And if we connect all these points, we get this beautiful sinusoidal, sinusoidal function this way. Now we're going to go talk about this a bit more in, in 
more precisely, but this right here is called a period, going from one starting point of zero and going through its full cycle. We went a full cycle up and we went to full cycle downwards. So we have a, a upward and a downward concavity. We went through it one whole cycle. This is called a period. And we'll define it later on, so don't worry too much about it right now. And this is our, our cosine function. Now we're gonna develop how to graph it. How do we graph it? Well, we're gonna plot specific points. We're gonna find our initial start point, our highest most point, our middle point, low point, and middle point again. These six points, I'm sorry, these five points will give us one period. So remember how we spent that time in section 4.1 and developing how to be really good at being lazy and not plotting more than we need? Well, this is where it comes to play. As long as I have my first, second, and third point, I know they're going to repeat at the bottom point, right? This is gonna be the same thing as the second, but reflected over, and this is gonna be exactly as our first point. So let's read this in class example. In each chart for sine of x and cosine of, cosine of t, lightly draw a vertical axis through the value r, a horizontal axis through the zeros, and lightly trace each function from zero radians to two pi. And that's what we did, right? And this is to get us ready. Let's do this for cosine. So notice, where does cosine start? At one? Yeah, it starts at one. So if we think of this as our x-axis, and we think of this as our y-axis, we have another graph to connect, right? We can plot a graph, and if each one of these were a point, we have another graph. But this one looks not as cool as the one above, right? I feel like the one above looks like a lot more is going on. Here it just seems like we kind of have a parabola with some extra hands on the side, or I don't know some extra hands on the side. But that's not the case. This is a full period of a cosine function. If we want to graph it, we would start at one. This would be my first point. Find our middle point, our lowest point. And from here, they all repeat. We have our middle point again. Our highest point will now be reflected over the x-axis so that it's above the x-axis. This will be one full period of a cosine function. Notice cosine begins at one or a version of one and sine begins at zero. So that's a big teller of what you have a cosine or a sine function. There are gonna be problems in the future where we're trying to determine if it's a sine or a cosine. Just look, look at where it starts. Really, any sine function or any cosine function can be written at, at, as, as each other. It just depends where you start, where you want to read it from. So if we read it from zero, we see that it starts at zero. If we read it from zero cosine, we see that it starts at one. Moving forward, the graphs of parent sine and cosine functions. We can use a chart of sine and cosine values on the previous page to see the outline of the graphs of the sine and cosine functions. We see that there are waves along the horizontal axis. Here are the graphs of f of t equals sine of t and g of t equals cosine of t from zero to pi. Notice that the standard radian values are shown on the horizontal t-axis and the sine and cosine values are shown for the vertical axis. Okay, so all I'm saying here is let's write it as decimals, not as radians. Not square roots, I mean. So notice your x values are in radians. You'd like to keep the pi and the radians. 
and you have all these points in between. You have 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.85, you go to 1. And this is just a different way of looking at them through decimals. So again, our x-axis, we want to keep our x-axis as radians. So we'll always keep that as radians. But if you want to see a numerical value, radical 3 over 2 is 0.85, radical 2 over 2 is 0.7, and we can add a decimal value to where those points fall, right? Because isn't a cosine of pi over 6 0.85, which is radical 3 over 2? Cosine of pi over 6, radical 3 over 2, and that's where that comes from. You can always think of it as a decimal. A quick note, using f of t for sine and g of t for cosine is arbitrary and is used here just to distinguish between the two functions. It is not common or necessary to label all the horizontal t values. It is much more common to label only the maxima and the minima and the zeros shown on the function. So if we want to, we, can, we don't have to find every single decimal point. We just need the main ones, meaning I just need the maximum, the zero, and the minima. So the maximum, the zero, and the minimum. That's all we really need, those three points, and we can replicate those points. Below we see one, only the maximum, minimum, and zeros are marked along the horizontal axis. And each function extends indefinitely to the left or right. So even though I know you can't, I, you can't see where my hands fall, but when we graphed it on that second page, we only graphed up for two pi. So we only graphed this window. Everything else we, we ignored. It wasn't part of our graph, right? We just focused on this little graph and we highlighted it and we break it out, right? We saw where that came from. But really, we can continue on forever. We can continue on to pause more than 2 pi and less than 2 pi. Just how, like how we work with numbers that are bigger than 360 or less than 360, we can also work with values that are larger than 2 pi or less than 0. And that would just give us towards the negative part of our x-axis and to larger points, right? All right, gt equals cosine of t. We have the same graph, and here is our 2 pi, our window we first saw. But we see that there's a lot more we can extend. We can extend to more than 2 pi. Or less than 2 pi. That's OK. It just depends what we're being asked to graph if we're told the starting point or how long we want it. OK, let's go ahead and move forward. Next part. Here are some common characteristics of sine and cosine graphs. One, the maximum max value of each parent function is one, and the minimum min value of each parent function is negative one. Now notice it's a parent function. Because just like we learned in 4.1, we can apply shifts to any function. So we can take a whole function with up or down, however many units our function says. All right, between each max and min, there is a zero where the graph crosses the horizontal axis. Note, the plural of maximum is minima and the plural of minimum is minima. Two, the proportion above the horizontal axis is concave downward and the portion below is concave upward. Every zero is a point of inflection. Amplitude, this one, this one's important. The amplitude of a sine or cosine graph is the height above the x-axis from zero to the maximum. So what is the amplitude? 
It's the height above the x-axis from the zero to a max, right? Being it has it highlighted right here, right? So an amplitude is just this part. So we have a zero and a max. That's called an amplitude. All right. Next, we have a cycle. A complete cycle is a portion of the graph that ends at the same value in which it began, usually from max to max and min to min, or from zero to non-consecutive zero. So it depends where you start reading your function. If you start reading it from here, start, not Saturday, start. If we start here, then I would have to go through another consecutive zero but going through a maximum and a minimum. So we have our max, we have a zero, and we have a min, now we're back to zero. So this would be one complete cycle. But it depends where you, it all depends on the eye of the beholder, right? What you're being asked to work with. So we can also take a look at a maximum, I'm sorry, at a cycle starting at one. So here we have our maximum, and I want to go through a minimum and go back to my maximum before I can call it a, a cycle. So I have a max, I have a zero, I have a min, and I must go back to my max before I have a cycle. So this right here would be one complete cycle. Now it just depends on your perspective, right? So we have a cycle going this way in blue, but we also have a cycle starting at zero going this way, right? It just depends on your perspective. For all of them, we have a max, a minimum, and a zero. And we start, we end where we started. So if we start at zero, we end at zero. If we start at a maximum, we end at a maximum. Fourth, super important, a period, exclamation point. So those are important things to know. Amplitude and a period. The period of a sine or cosine function is the horizontal x distance required to complete one cycle. So we saw what a cycle is. Now we're defining it as a distance to be called a period. One period is usually typically measured from a vertical axis, f of t axis to the end of one cycle. However, the period can be measured from any consecutive maxima or any consecutive minima for zeros. For zeros, we can measure from every other zero, not consecutive zeros. So here it's just showing you different, different cycles, different periods. So here we see we start at zero, and I know I must end at zero for it to be one period. So this is my period. I have a minimum and a max, right? But I can also have a period starting at a maximum. And therefore, I start where I end, max, max. And I went through a zero, a minimum, and a zero again. Or we can start from a negative. Let me erase the green one. Or I can start from a negative. I can start from, I can start from a negative. And in that case, I would have to end with a negative and I go through one cycle this way. So that is the length of a period. Now notice all of, them, all of them are saying that the length of a period is what? Two pi, right? A period is defined as two pi. In the diagram above, we see the period illustrated in four different intervals. We always calculate, calculate this as our rightmost value minus. That's a minus. Our leftmost value. 
So a from the y axis to the end of the first cycle, we have two pi minus zero. So we have these graphs here. So a, let me erase all of these. Let's color code them according to to each one. So let's do a in yellow. So we start at two pi minus zero. So A, we see it's right here, right? And we start with two pi and we, we start at zero and at two pi. So we have our rightmost value minus our leftmost value. Our rightmost value is two pi, our leftmost value is zero. Okay. Let's do B in blue. From a maximum to the next maximum. So B is right here. B is this one right here. So remember, it's your rightmost. Which one is your most rightmost? This is your rightmost, and this is your leftmost point. Our rightmost point is 4 pi. Our leftmost point is 2 pi. So we have 4 pi minus 2 pi. Our answer is 2 pi. For C, let's do C in green. C is right here, and C is this part right here. So our leftmost point is pi, our rightmost point is 3 pi. So 3 pi minus pi, we have 2 pi. For D, Let's see that in purple. We have D right here. And we have this cycle right here. We end at zero, so we stop it. We begin at zero, so we end at zero. And again, our rightmost point is three pi. Our leftmost point is two pi. And we have rightmost value, which is two pi, minus leftmost value, so minus negative. So be very careful here. Notice minus negative 3 pi over 2, we still get 2 pi. Note, to the graph above is on f of t equals cosine of t. The period for f of t equals sine of t is calculated the same way. So given the graph, calculate the period of the function. All right, so you have to first determine what is your cycle. You want to determine where you want to start and where you want to end. And from there, you want to pick your, we said it was rightmost minus leftmost. Right minus left. So let's go ahead and give this a try. So let's say I want to make this cycle start at pi over 6. And we go up, and I have to go back to 0. So this will be the end of my cycle. I have my, this is your leftmost point, and this is your rightmost point. Let's work it out. It's right minus left. So I have 5 pi over 3 minus pi over 6. We want to get that common denominator, right? So I multiply by 2 over 2. I have 10 pi over 6 minus pi over 6. So that gives us 4 pi over 6. Simplify. They have a common factor of 2. So we have 2 pi over 3. That is our period. Do you want to give B a try and see if we get the same thing? Yeah. Oh, I'll give you a minute to try B.
Okay, so let's see what happened. So I'm gonna start with this one just because it hasn't marked for us. Okay, so if I start this, then I must end there too, right? So I must end here. I go through my zero, my minimum, zero again, and I'm back at my maximum. So that would be a period. I will have to label my leftmost point and my rightmost point. So that's your leftmost and rightmost. So as you're working through this, it's okay to have a cheat sheet on the side. So in your cheat sheet, you're right. To find your period, you will need to find the measurement of a cycle, determine what your cycle is, and then you're going to subtract rightmost point minus your leftmost point. So that we have 7 pi over 12 minus 3 pi over 12, over 4. And you get that common denominator, so I multiply this by 3 over 3. So I have 7 pi over 12 minus 9 um, pi it's, over 12. Ooh. It's 17 pi. Oh, 17 pi. Uh, 3 pi over 4 and 17 pi. Ooh, you saved me just in time before I subtracted. Thank you so much. So 17 minus 9, we get 8. I need to not rest my hand on the side of the thing. So 17 minus 9, we get 8 pi over 12. They have a common factor of 4. 8 divided by 4 is 2. 12 divided by 4 is 3. So we have 2 pi over 3 as our period. All right, that's a period. So from one cycle, the measurement of one cycle from beginning to end is a period. But we've seen pictures of two pi periods, but it may vary. So let's go on to this next definition that's also very important, super important, the frequency. The frequency of a sine or a cosine wave is a number of complete cycles between two, zero and two pi. The frequency value appears in the argument of the function as the coefficient of t. In f of t equals cosine of 5t, the frequency is 5. In f of t equals sine of 2 over 3t, the frequency is 2 over 3. So please highlight this definition. A period is equal to 2 pi divided by the frequency. So there'll be some graphs that will have a lot of waves in one period, and that's because the frequency has been altered, right? We have more, more full cycles in one period. There's some where they're elongated, right? So we'll have less cycles in one period. But that's what we we'll want to look at. However, this is really easy to identify. A frequency, a frequency is just that number by the t. So it's, it's, Easy to identify, and we're going to put this formula into work. Period equals 2 pi over frequency. So let's take a look at 6. The period of the function is based on the frequency by this formula. For example, A, f of t equals cosine of t. One cycle is from 0 to pi, so we say we have a frequency of 1. Let's take a look at B. We have sine of 2t. There are two cycles from 0 to two pi, and the frequency is 2. Notice this 2 right here. That tells us our frequency. Now let's read this bullet point. The first cycle ends at pi. This point of pi is equivalent to pi, 2 pi divided by the frequency. So 2 pi divided by 2, it tells us pi. So what did this just tell us? This tells us the length of the period. Isn't that what we said? That your period is equal to 2 pi divided by your frequency? 2 pi divided by a frequency of 2. Okay. F of t, sine equals 3t. So this means we have a frequency of three, right? That's your frequency. That's our frequency of three. So this means we have three periods between 
0 and 2 pi, right? So what if we want to know the length of one period? What if we want the length of one period? Then I have to use my formula, 2 pi divided by the frequency. We have this here. So this would be one period will have a measurement of 2 pi over 3. And we see that in the picture above, right? We start at 0, and it ends at 2 pi over 3. That's one period. Let's do this. You try it too. Given the graph, identify the frequency of the wave and write the function. Also, identify the period of the function. Okay, so we need to determine if it's a sine or a cosine function. So, a sine function starts at, where does a sine function start? Sine starts at one, right? Take a look at your second page, your first page. I have that zero, I think. Yeah, take a look. Let's all look back to the other. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sign that zero. It's a cosine of that one. Yeah, and that's okay. That's, that's okay. It's, you're, I always forget this too. So let's take a look. Sine starts at zero, and cosine starts at one. So we can interchangeably use them both, but it depends how we start reading them. Are we reading them from zero or from one? So let's go back to where you try it. Okay, so if we want to start from here, it depends where you want to start. If we want to start from here, that would make that a what? That uh, would make that your cosine. Co cosine, right? Yeah. Cosine of t. Now this number right here that I'm trying to find, that's going to be our frequency. That's what you're dividing right. by, right? Yeah, we're trying to find that number. That's going to let us know how many periods they, there are from 0 to 2 pi. So we can cheat in a way. We can take a look at our graph. We see that we have a starting point, so let's work our way through one cycle. Start, low, and start again. Where do we stop? We stop at pi over 2, right? So we know the length of one cycle. And our formula above is, what does it say? Period equals 2 pi divided by your frequency. So you can do this several ways. You can use your formula. So we know that one period is the length of pi over 2, and we can use our formula. So our period is pi over 2 equals to 2 pi over your frequency, which we don't know. We're trying to find that out. So we can solve that way as well. Solve for f. So we can cross multiply pi times f equals 4 pi divided by pi. And we get f is equal to 4. So we get this number right here, 4. Now we're saying, what's the other way? You can cheat and see where you stop after 2 pi, how many cycles you have. So we have one cycle. We have two cycles. We have three cycles, and we have four cycles. Cool. So our graph that lets us trace our cycles matches our algebra. We use that formula, right? That period is equal to 2 pi divided by the frequency. We found the length of one period, which is 2 pi. This right here is our period. And we set it equal to our function. Our period is 2 pi. And we set it equal to 2 pi, pi over our frequency. 
And then from there, we cross multiply. I'm sorry. And then from there, we cross multiply to get 2 times 2 pi, which is 4 pi, pi times f, which is pi times f. And, and then we, we divide to get f by itself. OK, go ahead and get give B a try. No, we'll do B together. This one's tricky. OK. All right, so we start at, where are we starting at? We're starting at zero. At cool. So we know we have sine. And I want to find that blank of T. Right? What is my frequency? OK, well, I'm going to use my formula. You have your formula above. And it says that your period is equal to 2 pi divided by your frequency. OK, by the looks of it, my period is going to be twice as long, right? We have half a period at 2 pi. So that means we would end at 4 pi. So the length of one period is 4 pi. So let's use our formula. 4 pi is equal to 2 pi divided by the frequency. Two pi divided by frequency, which is f. Okay, let's go ahead and cross multiply. So I can write this as over one, and then we cross multiply. So we have two pi is equal to four pi times f. Let's divide by four pi. Divide by four pi. Our pi's cancel. We're left with one half. F is equal to one half. So this is our, our graph f of t equals sine of one half t. You can also write it as sine of t over two. That's the same as one half t. Both of them will work. Let's continue forward. The graph of the parent sine function. Recall from section 4.1, when graphing a parabola, we don't need to find every point. Once we identify the vertex and two or three points to the right of the vertex, we have enough information to plot a symmetric partners and draw the graph. This notion of finding only a few necessary points is extended to the graphs of sine and cosine. The most important points, the feature points, are the maxima, minima, and zeros. For the parent functions, these occur at the axial radian measures, as shown below. So here we're going to graph sine. Now this right here is your domain. So this is telling us that we only want to start, we only want values between 0 and 2 pi. So we want to start at 0 and at 2 pi. OK, so I want to plot some points. I want to plot the lowest, the maximum, and enough for 2 2 pi. So we have this here. We have our 0, our max, 0, min, and 0. So if I start at 0, I get 0, and that's one point. Now from there, I want to find my maximum. The maximum occurs at pi over 2. So we get a 1. We have our 0 again at pi, and our minimum at negative 1. And then 2 pi, we have our 0 again. So we connect them. You have one period of a sine function. And you have all your work right here, right? You have a chart. You're going to pick values for t or for x, however you want to think of it as. You're going to plug them in. So sine of 0 gives us 0. Sine of pi over 2, we get 1. Sine of pi, we get 0. Sine of 3 pi over 2, we get negative 1. Sine of 2 pi, we get 0. Where are they getting these numbers from? You use a unit circle. Okay. Remember that sine is your y value. So you know how you always have a point x comma y? You want the y. That's how we're evaluating these sine functions. 
Okay, tracing the sine wave. When drawing the sine wave, it is important to include the concavity and endpoints of inflection. In, in class example three, trace the wave. Notice the concavity and the endpoints of inflection. Also mark the radian values in pi along each x-axis whenever the curve reaches a maximum or a minimum. So all this is trying to say is it wants you to trace it. It wants you to literally grab your pencil and it wants you to trace it. Because notice your graph does not go peak, 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 right? It's not pointy at all. And that's something that's really important. We have to make sure we graph nice, smooth graphs. We want to make sure we make, make it a point to trace these waves. You don't want to make pointy waves. Also, when you're working with your graph, we're so used to letting your x be points, be decimals. Remember, you want radians. So we just did sign, this would be zero. This point right here, that would be, uh, this, this, this zero. The zero would be at two pi. The zero would be at pi. So this would be at pi over two. And this would be three pi over two, right? So you want to find these points. When you set yourself up to graph it, set yourself up with x being radians. Your y can be numbers. You want this to be numbers in decimal form. But here, you want to make sure you want radians. Now, for the most part, your next exam, I'm thinking it's going to be multiple choice, but I will force you to turn in a portion using your handwriting so I can look to make sure that you're drawing waves and not pointy graphs. Remember, I do not want pointy graphs. You'll lose points if you draw mountains. In class example four, so you can do this in your paper. Draw the sine wave using the, mi the max, min, and zero points. Keep in mind the concavity and points of inflection. So again, your publisher is really big on making sure you're drawing waves and not points, not mountains. You want waves. So again, your publisher being very particular, draw the cosine wave using the max, min, and zero points. Keep in mind the concavity and points of inflection. So you want to make sure you're drawing a wave. Practice drawing a wave. Don't draw peaks. That's not what we want. Graph the cosine function. So again, in case you lost me when we did the, our last example, you want to make sure you have unit circle handy. Have it out. If you don't have one handy, you can print one out. You can just Google search unit circle. Um, you can use your calculator as you're working with this. We're going to work it out. Remember, when a point's given as x comma y, this is always your cosine. This is always our sine. And this is going to help us evaluate at each radian measure. So let's do example six. Graph the cosine function. In class example six, graph the function f of t equals cosine of t for the domain of zero to two pi. Choose any axial values of t. All right, so you want to choose those peak points. Cosine starts at one, so if you choose zero, if you choose zero, you're going to start at one. Because cosine of zero, if you look at zero, your x is one. You have the point one comma zero, right? Cosine is one. And then it wants you to choose 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is 0. We have this point at pi over 2 equals 0. Take a look at unit circle at pi. We have the point negative 1 comma 0. So cosine is negative 1. 
So at pi, we have negative 1, the cosine. If we let t be 3 pi over 2, at 3 pi over 2, we have the point 0 comma negative 1. Cosine is 0. So we're at 0 again. And then back to 1 for 2 pi. Okay, now practice drawing that smooth wave. And that's our sine function. That's one cycle of our sine function. Notice that for a parent function without any shifts or no changes to the frequency, one whole cycle is one whole unit circle. The argument of sine and cosine functions can be variable, can be any variable we choose, theta, t, alpha, or x, to name a few. From this point on, we will use x as a standard variable of argument. The parent sine and cosine functions. The graphs of the parent functions f of x equals sine of x and f of x equals cosine of x used as models for all the other sine and cosine function graphs. Let's take a look at the characteristics of each. So here it kind of has a breakdown. We have the amplitude for these is one. Notice the amplitude is how high up or down it goes from the center. The frequency, how many waves we have, how many cycles we have in, in two pi is one. The period is two pi and our y-intercepts are zero and negative one. So these are just for the parent functions. Notice there's no shifts. Featured x-axis values technique, half and half. After x equals zero, there are four evenly spaced major values to be marked along the x-axis in one cycle. So this is your mentality to when you want to graph. So this is how to graph or how to think about it. So we have four points or four halves that we're working with. We have this half right here. I'm sorry, four fourths. We have this fourth right here, this fourth right here, and this fourth right here. That will be helpful to find these points for each one of those fourths if I divide it by two and divide that two by two. So first, after identifying the period, locate, locate and mark its x value. Second, on the x-axis, locate halfway mark between zero and the period and write its value. One fourth, on the x-axis, locate halfway mark between zero and the half period, write its value. The fourth, the three fourth period. This is three times the quarter period on the x-axis. It is the halfway mark between the half period and the period. So what it's saying is we draw a graph, which is the last graph we drew. We have four portions we need to consider. These four portions are, this is one portion, this is another, another, and another. So it's saying if you know the entire period, you can divide it by two and you'll get this point. Once you know half, you can divide the first half by two and find that second half. And you can go ahead and from there, take that one fourth and multiply it by three to find the third part. That's how it's describing it as. Think of it, think of it, thinking of it as fourths and working from there. Let's do in class example seven. Given the period as shown on the graph, we use the half and half technique to find the featured x values, the half period, quarter period, and three quarter period. Simplify whenever possible. Okay, so we know one period is three pi. So we know a period is three pi. 
Now, if I know the length of one period, I want to find these tick marks. I want to know what they are because that will help me graph my function. Okay, if I divide it by two, if I divide it by two, I'll get this point right here. Let's go ahead and divide it by two. So the one half one. So I have three pi divided by two. Well, that's already three pi over two. So this is three pi over two. Okay, the one fourth portion. If I take the one half I just found and I divide it by another half, I'll get this point right here, that one fourth mark. So I take three pi over two and I divide it by two. I divide it by two. Essentially, we're dividing by multiplying by a half, right? Because how do we multiply? I'm sorry, how do we divide fractions? We have three pi over two times one over two. This gives us three pi over four. So this is three pi over four. All right, now that I found my fourth, this is one fourth, this is two fourths, this is three fourths. So to find this other one, I go ahead and multiply our answer by three. Three pi over four times three, you get nine pi over four. So that's how we can go ahead and find these special values because this will help us find a cycle, right? Because a cycle, if we start at zero, we find our maximum, we find our minimum, I'm sorry, our zero, we find our minimum, and we find our way back to our zero. So we only need those special points to graph one cycle. And if it wants more than one cycle, then I can always repeat those same points over and over again. So let's read this again. So first, you want to identify your period. So it says first period. After identifying the period, locate and mark its value on the x-axis. Find the period and mark it. Two, half the period. On the x-axis, locate halfway between the period and zero and mark its value. So we divide it by two. Third, one fourth period. On the x-axis, locate halfway mark between zero and the half period, write its value. So we take our period, divide by two, and divide that by two. Fourth, three fourths period. This is three times the quarter. So this is one fourth of the period, the quarter. On the x-axis, it is the halfway mark between the half period and the period, write its value. Now, another way you can think about it, and this is how, how I do it, is you want to first find the period. Two, divide by four. And then you use your starting point, whatever it may be, whatever in, um, interval you're working with. And then from there, you just add one fourth of it each time and then continue adding just one fourth of the period. Since you divide it by four, you know one fourth of your function. But you can do it whichever way you'd like. Moving forward, featured x axis values, technique two, starting standard counting unit. An alternate technique to find the labeling featured x values is to first is to first make four evenly spaced marks to the right of the axis. Next, find the value of a quarter period, one fourth times the period. This is a standard counting unit, so it can be placed on the first of the four x-axis marks nearest to the x-axis. The next marks are multiples of the standard counting unit. So it's kind of how I said the alternate way of doing it. So, if I know if this is zero, 
and from zero to my first point is pi over six. To get to my next point, I'm gonna add another pi over six, right? So pi over six plus pi over six, I get two pi over six. I add another pi over six. So this is three pi over six. And I add another pi over six. So this is four pi over six. And of course, you simplify each time. So this would be pi over three. This would be pi over two. And this would be two pi over three. You simplify your fractions. So try B and C. If you know one fourth of it, if you're starting at zero and you know one fourth of it, from zero to our first check mark is two pi over five, and I add the same value four times to get our period, right? So go ahead, do B and C. Okay, let's, let's regroup. So we said that once you find the one fourth of it, which would be one fourth times your period, then I can go ahead and just add one fourth each time to find the tick mark, the next tick mark, because this is what we need. We need to find these radians. All right. So we have two pi over five, we're gonna add another two pi over five, so we have four pi over five. We're gonna add another two pi over five, so we have six pi over five. Add another two pi over five, eight pi over five. Cool, and we don't need to simplify any further, that one's good. Let's move on to the next one and add three pi over eight. So zero, three pi over eight, it has a measurement of three pi over eight, plus three pi over eight, we have six pi over eight. Plus another three, we have uh, nine pi over eight. Plus another three, we get 12 pi over eight. And some of these need to be simplified, right? Six and eight have a common factor of two. So it'd be four and three. So it'd be three pi over four. This one to be simplified have a common factor of four. So that would be two and three, three pi over two. There we go. So once we know all these x values, I can do a t-chart. And I can have my x values that I want to work with. And really, I only have my first three. Because once I have those first three, I can repeat the same ones. It's going to have the same high and low. Moving forward, featured x values on a second cycle. To create a second cycle of the function, we make four evenly spaced marks and we use a standard counting unit to label each mark. So you keep working the same way. If I know one period, then I multiply by one fourth. So I have two pi times one fourth. And that would give us two pi over four. This simplifies to be pi over two. So my first one is pi over two. 
So therefore, to get to each one, I'm going to add pi over 2. Keep adding pi over 2 each time. And that will let us know all the tick marks we need to work with, right? Same thing here. If I know one period is 8 pi over 3, you take 8 pi over 3 and we multiply it by 1 over 4, which gives us 8 pi over 3 times 4. The 4 simplify, so we're left with 2 pi over 3. So therefore, from 1 to the next, we'll just have to add, why keep adding plus or minus? Just add, add 2 pi over 3. Okay, let's do example 10. We are now well prepared to graph sine and cosine functions. We start by graphing two cycles of each prime function. Okay, I'll let you do in class example 10 on your own because it's a parent function, you, you kind of have the first cycle, you just keep adding to it. All right, 196, modulated sine and cosine functions. So the changes of the graph occur when there are changes in the function. The initial modulation of a function occurs in the amplitude of period and where the function is positive or negative. So an amplitude is from zero to your height. That's your amplitude. Your reflection is to reflect over the x-axis. Your frequency is how many periods you have in, uh, in 2 pi. And your period is defined as 2 pi over b. And your y-intercept is your highest y-value. But it depends on sine and cosine. Let's go ahead and do in-class example 12. Graph two cycles of each function by determining the amplitude, whether the graph is reflected or not, the frequency, and the period. All right, so I'll do the easy one. Two is your frequency. That's something we, we just learned. Two is our frequency. Is it reflected? B, is it reflected? Well, I will have to have a negative right here. Do I have a negative? No. So this one's not reflected. Your amplitude. Your amplitude depends how far up and down we go. So maybe you might have to wait to graph that one. And the length of your period, you have to do some work for this one. The length of your period. Do you remember that formula to find your period? Let's go back into our notes. To find our period, I think it was like in page three. Yeah, let's see, the period is, period is two pi? Period is two pi, yeah, and it goes based on that, on page two, 188. That formula we highlighted, right? Yeah, yeah. Per period equals okay. 2 pi divided by your frequency. And we also have it handy into our box. Our box also has it here. Our period is 2 pi over b, where b is our frequency, right? All right. So period, period equals two pi divided by our frequency. All right, let's set it up. So our period, we want to find out what that is. So we're going to take two pi and divide it by a frequency, which is two. So we have a period of pi. Okay, let's go ahead and graph it. So we start with zero. Now, how do I find our tick marks? So one period will be pi, and two periods thus will be two pi. But I want to find these tick marks. I want to find the halfmost and two more from that, right? 
So we learned that we're going to take our period and divide it by two, right? I'm sorry, divide it, multiply it by four. Okay, so to find points, we're going to take our period and multiply it by one fourth. So in this case, we learned that our period is pi. That's the length of one period. So pi times one fourth will give us pi over four. So if we're starting at zero, the first one will be pi over four. And then we're gonna add another pi over four so that we get two pi over four. We're gonna add another pi over four so we get three pi over four. And we add another pi over four, we get back to pi. Cool. Now let's go ahead and evaluate. Now you're gonna need more space in this. I oh, know wait, you didn't give me more space. Let's go ahead and do a chart, a T chart. Let's go ahead and work this out. So let's plug in these values, pi over four, two pi over four, and three pi over four. Our formula is sine of two x. Let's plug in those values. So I want to find sine of two times pi over four. So this is the same as sine. We simplify so it's a two at pi over two. So look at your unit circle. Sine is y. What is sine of pi over two? Isn't that one? Uh, yeah. We have pi over four and one. That's a point. All right, two pi over four. Let's plug that into our function. Let's let that meet the x. So sine of two times x, and x is two pi over four. All right, these cancel, so I'm left with two. So I have sine of uh, two pi over two, my twos cancel, I'm left with sine of pi. So pi, take a look at pi. Sine is a y. So at pi, sine of pi, we get zero. So we have the point two pi over four and zero. Let's take a look at three pi over four. So we're gonna plug that in. So I have sine, of two times three pi over four. These cancel out, we're left with two. So sine of three pi over two. At three pi over two, sine is negative one. So we're left with negative one. So I have three pi over four and negative one. Let's plug these values in. So to begin, let's simplify this one. This one should be pi over four, right? Pi over two. Let's plot these points. So we go up to one. So I need a one and I need a negative one. Let's go ahead and plot these points. At zero, sine of zero is zero. So we know we start there. At pi over four, once we plug that, that in, we got one. At two pi over four, which is pi and a half, we got zero again. And at three pi over four, we got negative one. And at pi, well, we know from here, we have these points. We know from here it's gonna repeat, right? So we know we're gonna go back to pi. And we're gonna find we're gonna find more point more points to to continue working with. Right? We have another cycle to consider. We know we're gonna divide into and find four points from there. And it's gonna repeat. 
we start at zero. It's going to go back to one, back to zero, back to one, and back to zero again. So this would give us two cycles. I just have to continue to add pi over four. And there we go. Any question about in class example 12? Mm, not at the moment. Not at the moment. Okay. Let's do in class example B, and I think we'll call it a day from there. The rest are just the same thing over and over again. So let's do in class example B. I'm going to erase our work, but if you want to see this again, you can just go back to this point in our Zoom lecture. And it is recording this time for sure. And I'll post it. It takes about an hour to uh, send it over to me and you'll have access to it. I'll post it, I'll make an announcement to so you can see the Zoom lecture. Sounds good, and then the homework for before break is due tonight, right? I yes. Believe. Okay. Okay, so let's work on the amplitude. Oh, we never answered the amplitude on the first one. So from our, from, huh, from our zero, from our zero to our highest point, is one, so our amplitude is one. All right, this one, your amplitude, I believe it's that number. Is that what the box says? Amplitude is always the A, yeah, the A is the amplitude. So our amplitude would be two. Reflected, yes, it is reflected. It's reflected because we have that minus, so we say yes. Frequency, our frequency comes from that number. That is our frequency. So we have two over three. And our period, we need to find our period. It is two pi divided by your B, which is two pi, two over three. So we have two pi divided by two over three. So let's rewrite this. We have two pi times three over two. Our twos cancel, so we're left with three pi. Our period is three pi. All right, so what period will be up to three pi? If it wants two cycles, if it wants two cycles, our second cycle will end at six pi. Okay. Now to graph this, I need to find some points. I have a half and a fourth and a fourth. I take the length of one period, which is three pi, and I multiply it by one fourth to get three pi over four. So from our starting point at zero, I'm gonna go three pi over four, and I'm going to add another three pi over four. So you get six pi over four, and add another three pi over four to get nine pi over four. And that'll get us to 12 pi over four, which is three, right? Now you must simplify these fractions. This one I must simplify six pi over four. That's three, that's two. So three pi over two. pi over two. Okay, we're gonna plug these values into our function. Or you know that it's a cosine function and it starts at one. It starts at one and it goes all the way down to negative one. Right? But I want you to get into the habit of doing the chart and working it out. Because when you have shifts, horizontal and vertical and these other shifts, if going to be a lot different to work with. So that's why I want you to go into the trouble of using your chart, even though your author is not preparing you for that. So let's go ahead and do a chart. 
I have my X values. I'm going to plug in. I'm going to plug in 3 pi over 4 into my graph, which is negative 2 cosine of 2 over 3x. All right, so I have negative 2 times cosine of 2 over 3 times x, which is 3 pi over 4. All right, so desimplify, I have a 2 and a 1. These are gone. So I'm left with negative 2 cosine of pi over 2. Cosine at pi over 2 is 0. So I have 2 times 0, we get 0. So I have the point 3 pi over 4 and 0. All right, now we have 3 pi over 2. Let's plug it in for x. So I have negative 2 times cosine of 2 over 3 times 3 pi over 2. My 2's cancel, my 3's cancel, so I'm left with cosine of pi times negative 2. Cosine at pi, if we take a look at pi, cosine is the x, that's negative 1, times negative 2, we get 2. So I have the point 3 pi over 2. And two. All right, let's plot these points. Cosine starts at, oh, we didn't do zero. Let's do zero. So if I plug in zero for x, I have negative two times cosine of two over three times zero. Well, anything times zero is zero. So we're left with cosine of zero times negative two. If we take a look at zero, cosine is one. So I have negative 2 times 1, we get negative 2. So at 0, we have negative 2. Let's go ahead and plot these points. 0, comma, negative 2. So our amplitude will be 2. So we have 2 and negative 2. So 0 starts at negative 2. 3 pi over 4 is 0. 3 pi over 2, we said is 2. Okay, now from there, we know it's going to repeat, right? Back down to 0, back down to negative 2. And then we're going to have four more tick marks that go back to 0, back to positive 2, back to 0, back to negative 2. So notice, because we had a reflection across the x-axis, instead of starting at 1, or in this case 2, we start at negative 2. So it's helpful to use a chart. All right. So I'm sorry the lecture was so long, but this is a very intense section. This whole chapter is a very intense. Mm -hmm. So the, right? So um, make sure you post those questions in the discussion board. There's no point value to it. It's just a safe space to where we can talk about math, post our questions, our thoughts. And there's no such thing as like, a question last minute or a question that doesn't apply. I mean, sometimes things just escape from our brain and we're like, what does this mean again? So post any question. There's no such thing as a silly question or an old question. I will post homework for 4.2 on my math lab. Okay. So, so, no so you, don't have, you don't have to upload homework anymore. If you want more practice, you can use your book. But I think from here on out, we can use my math lab for your homework. Okay. That was the purpose of it. So after and, tonight's assignments, um, we're going to be turning everything in on MATLAB. Yeah. And the reason I want to do this is because we don't have that face-to-face -face or that group time to where I said, okay, work in your groups, compare homework problems, or if you ask me a homework problem. I mean, I can, I can help you out, but maybe we're so caught up in just going through lecture, we might forget. And what's nice about my math lab is that you can, um, you get automatic feedback. So it'll tell you if it's right or wrong um, right away. So that's a cool feature about my math lab. Okay. So hey, that's why I wanted to incorporate that. Yeah. Ms. Angelica, a quick question. Uh, have you been yeah. getting my emails? I emailed you like a couple of days ago about some question I had in chapter three. Mm, 
email? When did you send the email? What email did you send it? My school email? Uh, I think I sent it through Canvas. Canvas? Let me, let me double check. I sent it on uh, the 31st. 31st? Please collect. No, I haven't checked my email. I'm sorry. That's okay. Mm, I see a, I see a question. I'll respond afterwards. I see it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, no problem. Okay. So I'll post this as an announcement on Canvas. Um, your homework will be due via my math lab and the code's there. And I'll post the code over again so you can add the course. It's free. So they're very nice to us. They gave us a free $90 code. So that's super cool. Um, per person. So that's a lot of money there. They're skipping out. So they're very nice. Um, so that way you don't have to go through the hassle of taking a picture and uploading. You can just go there and do it. And it gives you automatic feedback. So it'll tell you if it's right or wrong and tell you, tells you how to go about correcting it. I will make homework too intensive to where it's too much. I hope for it to be about an hour per section, not an hour, like half an hour per section, since we have um, quite a bit to go through. I will also post an uploaded schedule, an um, updated schedule, because um, I'm going to omit some sections just so it doesn't feel too rushed. That's um, all I have for the moment. Are quizzes, are they all multiple choice right now? Yeah, everything is multiple choice. All right, I just want to make sure. Yeah. And then the quizzes and, that are due for this section, when are they due by? Mm, I'll leave them open until our test day. How about that? That works. But don't don't make it to your, where you shoot yourself on the foot and you're just trying to go through these quizzes like half an hour before your test opens, you know? Make no, sure you pace, you pace yourself. But I know it's hard to find time at home to get things done or depending on your job, you might have to work more because of what's going on. And everyone has different situations. So I think just to be safe and considerate for everyone, I'll do it so that's due before our exam. And then, Professor, if, when we finish taking the quizzes, are we able to, like, reopen them to use them the same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So your homeworks, your quizzes will be open. There is unlimited try. And um, it records your highest score. And they stay open. So use them as a study tool. Use them with a friend. Why don't you make a Zoom meeting with your friends? And you can do them together. They're randomized. So not everyone gets the same question, but they're the same concept. So if you can help each other on the concept, each question will, will have a sim similar concept, different numbers. So we're together. I encourage you to. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty. You're welcome. So I have your exams graded. I'll post them right now. Um, they, they took a while to get through. But um, I think if you check within an hour, this should be up. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, have a nice day. Have a nice okay. weekend. This okay. section is very intense, so make sure you give yeah. it a try. I'll open the homework right now. But make sure you, you, you start thinking about where these numbers come from. Be comfortable with the unit circle. My biggest advice is just have the unit circle handy. It's, it's, it makes things much easier. And if we have any homework questions, could we, the discussion board, or could we email you directly? Yeah. So what's cool about my math lab is the, there's a function on the side that says ask my instructor. Oh, okay. And what you can do with that is it sends me your question or the question problem you're working with. And you can make a comment like, I'm not sure what this is asking for. I don't know. And you can give it a try. But what's cool about my math lab is you can also choose, choose a similar problem. Yeah. And it walks you through step by step of a similar problem. And it gives you the answer of that similar problem, right? Yeah, it cool. gives you the answer. Awesome. Yeah. So cool. that's a cool feature about it. So since I'm not there, you can get feedback. All right. All right. So have a nice weekend. I'll send lots of announcements of things that I forgot to say. All right, Professor. Yeah. Thank so you. I apologize. Bye. Have Bye. a nice weekend. Thank you. And this will record, right? Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. I'll also record, yeah.